So uh, before we get into the Word of God this morning, would you join me in a word of prayer for this Word that we can prepare our hearts to receive it. Lord, we just come to you today. Lord, we ask you to uh, prepare us for your message. Anoint our ears to hear the message that you have for us. God, I just pray that we're able to receive what you have for us today. God, I just pray that as this word goes forth, it would not return void just as your word declares. That it would, it would speak into our hearts, that it would change us forever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We are in John chapter 8. We're about halfway through. We're going to start in verse 12. Uh, some things have been going on. We, we saw in the, the past uh, week that, that we, uh, Jesus had been to the Feast of Tabernacles. Or the Feast of Booths, it's called. Uh, either way you want to call it, it's all the same thing. And what they would do, it was a celebration of coming out of Egypt. It was to remind them what they had been delivered from, their time in the wilderness, and what God had done. Uh, we talked about the, the, they would make these little makeshift huts, and they would stay in these huts all week long during this feast. They would build a little lean-to out in the backyard, and, and part of the requirement was you had to be able to see the stars through the roof. Uh, I mean, it, you, it was just, you were, you were kind of out out in the open just barely protected and it was to symbolize the temporary dwelling that they were in until they got to the promised land and so they in as part of that there was another part of it that in the feast that uh they had big uh, big huge candelabras that would be big columns of light that they would light up at the temple and in the temple they would light these huge lights as some symbolism for something that took place in the wilderness anybody want to take a guess okay i'll tell you what it was the uh, <laughs> as they were coming Coming out of Egypt, uh, they, they, God said, I will go before you. He was a, he was a cloud at day and a, and a fire at night, a pillar of fire at night. And so uh, it just, it's just really practical that you would have fire at night, isn't it? Because it brought light to the whole situation. You knew exactly where you were going. You just follow the fire in the sky. Uh, it, it, it helped light up everything so you didn't stumble and fall. And, and, and with all of this in mind, we see that Jesus is, is he's teaching the people. And he's been teaching the people at the feast that, you know, and the festival's been going on, all this stuff is happening. And uh, I know you're like, we, we've already ended the feast. But John has this, this way that he keeps, he'll talk about something and say it's over, and then he'll keep talking about stuff that goes back to it. Okay, it, 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 all this stuff that he's talking about. And it's kind of like, you ever have somebody tell you a story and they're like, oh yeah, then there was this part. Well, this is John. That's what he does. He, and, and then there was this part where Jesus was teaching, and he's teaching in the temple, and, and right in the middle of church, remember we talked about it uh, last week, uh, the, the knuckleheads come dragging in the lady. They, they bring in the, the woman who was caught in adultery. They didn't bring homeboy in. Just brought the lady in. And right in the middle, he's teaching. They're in the temple. They're having church. He's, he's bringing the word to people. And then here comes some religious people, if you will. And they, bring, they come in and throw this lady at his feet and say, she's an adulteress. What are we going to do about it? Right in the middle of church, which would be very awkward. So Jesus takes a break, he, talk, he, he, he goes and scribbles in the dirt, and then everybody leaves, and, and, he, and he basically frees this woman of the bondage that she's in, right in the middle of church. Amen. Which is amazing, is it not, that you can go to church and get free. Amen. I mean, a lot of you may came in here today and said, same old, same old, we're going we're gonna to have a singing, we're going to have a message, and then we get to go to the restaurant. Or we got a roast and, you know, cooking in the crock pot. We got whatever your thing may be. And you've got this already planned out what your day is going to be like. We're going to go to the core. We're going to do this. We're gonna, but hey, just, just take a break just for a minute. And let's expect God to, to, to deliver people. Okay? Let's let God bring some healing. And in, in, in church, you, in church is for healing? Yes! In, in case you came in jacked up today, you're not alone. Okay, we're all jacked up, we're all messed up, we all got problems, and we all need Jesus just as much as you. And you may be sitting there thinking, and everybody here's got their act together. This is the wrong church for that. Okay, we, we don't have our act together. We all need Jesus to bring healing. We, this is the, 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 the hospital for the hurting right here. That's what this is all about. And the great physician is here, and he wants to set people free. Amen. So what is he going to do? He, he, the lady is sent away. You know, he tells her, go, sin no more. I, I'm not condemning you. You've been set free. Uh, she even calls him Lord the whole time. I mean, this beautiful time of her being set free from her shame. And then he goes, what, what's going to happen? He goes right back to the message. 
He's like, we're getting right back in this thing. So, and it, right after this happens, and verse 12 picks up here. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have light of life. So he, he's literally standing in the temple courts. It must be getting dark at this time. The evening is starting to kick in, and the candelabras are lit. And literally, these candelabras are symbolizing the, the, the Shekinah glory that led them through the wilderness at night. And he, he's pointing to the candelabras, and they know what it means. All of them know what that is representing. And he says, I'm the light. As he's pointing to the fire that's lit, that the whole temple is lit up with. I, I, you remember Christmas? Anybody was here for Christmas? The past couple times we've had uh, candlelight services. And it's so funny because uh, the kids would be in here with us as we have the candlelight services. And we don't let the kids hold the candles because that goes bad places really quick. So adults are holding candles, but it's so funny from this side of it because I'm watching out here and people are holding their candle and we're singing beautiful praise and worship songs. And, and then the kids are like, they're, they're just focused on the fire, focused on the candle. Like, can I touch it? I want to hold it. Can I hold it? Dad, dad, dad. And they're, they're just, just fixed on the flames. They're fixed on the fire because there's something about that fire. There's something about that light in darkness that draws your attention. Come on. Come on. It's getting to the point right now where you can't leave your porch light on anymore. Because all of the bugs that are drawn to the light. You, you, we walk out our front porch and it's like a war zone. You, 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 you. All these things flying up, coming in for landing. And it, it's crazy. Because light draws attention. Light, there's something about light that's special. See, whenever you walk into a, a room and the light comes on, they, they, I, I, was, I was at a house the other day and you open a closet door and the light would turn on. I was like, ooh, sitting there playing with the door. Like, how do I know it's off? I don't. So I had to go in the closet and shut the door and yeah, the light went off. I was like, this is amazing. How does it know? And then I'm like, oh, there's a stupid switch behind the door. Okay. But whenever the light comes on, no one has to tell you the light's on, do they? Light reveals itself. When light starts to shine in darkness, I, you, 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 you ever have like somebody real quick? My mom used to do, they'd go and turn on the light. Amy does it to Sophie, it's so hilarious. Sophie will be in her room, just pitch black. It's like noon and the windows are closed and she's hiding in her bed. And, and not really noon, but you know, she likes to sleep a lot. But, you know, it's... It, and we go and, and we turn on the light. Turn off the light! Because at first it's so harsh. When the light comes in, it's, it, 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 it makes you aware. All of a sudden things start to change. It, 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 it reveals itself. And if you've ever been in the light, you, you, you could be in here today and you could say, man, it is bright or it is not very bright or it's dim or, or look at the lights. And, and, and there would be some that may say, well, I don't see lights. You know, for whatever reason, maybe they have blinders on. Maybe they are blind. Maybe they just don't, they're not, their eyes aren't working, and they're not able to experience that. They can't see the light for whatever reason. And they tell you, I just don't see light. Does that, do, well, if you don't see light, then it, is it still there? If you've experienced light, you know when it's there. Do you not? Man, can you see the comparison to God in that? Yep. When the light has turned on and the world is trying to tell you, God doesn't exist. Oh, brother, the light is on. Yes. You may have blinders. You may be spiritually blind and not able to see the God that I see. But you can't tell me the light is not on. Amen. Because I have experienced light and I've experienced dark. And I know the difference. Light reveals itself. Another thing about light is when it comes on, it doesn't just make you aware that it's there. It makes you aware of everything that's there. I mean, I, I, I was one of those kids. I didn't want to sleep with the light off. I didn't, I, I was, no, I, I don't, I got to have night light something because if you turn off the light, I don't know that that shirt in the closet isn't a man. 
You turn off the light and like, somebody's in the closet. They turn on the light. It's just your shirt. Yeah, but when you turn off the light, he turns into a man. Maybe you didn't have that problem, but I am jacked. I didn't, I don't, I don't like darkness. I don't, I don't, I'm, I'm not that, per- I remember going to Carlsbad Caverns and, and they used to do that thing where they turn off the lights and you couldn't see your hand in front of your face. I think they've since quit doing that because people <laughs> would hurt themselves or freak out or whatever. But it, 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 some people probably wondered, are the lights coming back on? Cell phones breaking out. But we, it, when you've been in the light, you want the light. And it makes you aware of everything that's there. It helps you define the world around you. That's what light does. It helps you to see that that thing you just banged your shin on, it's just a chair. It helps you to see that, that there's a, a pathway that you can walk down and there's, pl- there, there's obstacles in the way. That, that there may be pitfalls along the way, but with the light, you can see it coming. So many of us, we've allowed the darkness to define the world instead of the light to define the world. Maybe your, your life is in a dark place right now and you, and, and, and you haven't, you're, you're not able to navigate life as clearly as you'd like. Maybe, maybe you, you feel like you're, you, you, you've just been left behind or you're lost or the, the, the light isn't on and you just feel yourself just stumbling through life. But when the light turns on, and I'm going to tell you how to turn the light on in just a second. When the light turns on, all of that is revealed. And you're able to see, quit stepping in the gopher holes, idiot. Quit falling in the ditches. You can see them now. And the way you turn the light on is by inviting the light of the world into your life. Amen. See, Jesus is the light of the world. He, he's standing there. He's pointing at the fire and he's saying... I'm the light. I'm the one who led you out of the darkness. I'm the one who led you out of bondage. I'm the one who led you out of Egypt. That's me. I'm the light of the world. And all the people are standing around. They're listening to Jesus talk. And if you just invite Jesus into your life today... I'm going to tell you, the Bible tells us in Psalm 119 and 105, your word is a lamp for my feet and a light for my path. Your word. Well, if you remember John 1, when we were talking about John 1, who's the word? Jesus is the word. Jesus is the light. He is the light to your path. And when he will reveal the pathway in front of you. Just as he did the children of Israel as they left Egypt, coming out of bondage. He lit the way so they could feel the security that they needed as they walked in darkness, as they they plodded through the wilderness. He provided everything they needed, including the big nightlight in the sky. So they wouldn't think it was a shirt in the closet. Verse 13, the Pharisees challenged him. Didn't they just get through bringing a lady and then now all these people leave and some other guys are like, that didn't work. Plan B, here it comes. The Pharisees challenged him. Here you are appearing as your own witness. Your testimony is not valid. What are they? He's telling them, I'm God, man. I'm the, the light. I'm the Shekinah glory, that, that, the, the light of the world. And then they're saying, that's just what you say. And so if you say it, it's my word against your word. Anybody you ever hear that? And so it's just, you know, we just got to agree to disagree. And we're all just going to be happy about it, right? Your, your word is not valid because it's just you talking. Jesus answered, even if I testify on my own behalf, my testimony is valid. For I know where I came from and where I'm going. But you have no idea where I come from and where, or where I'm going. You judge by human standards. I pass judgment on no one. But if I do judge, my decisions are true because I am not alone. I stand with the Father who sent me. 
In your own law, it is written that the testimony of two witnesses is true. I am one who testifies for myself. My other witness is the Father who sent me. It says, I pass judgment on no one. You judge by human standards. You're, you're, you're trying to think like the world thinks, and it doesn't work. He said, I'm not judging. Right now, hey, at this point where Jesus is coming, I, I don't want people to get it twisted. They, they, they're like, well, see, God doesn't judge us. Jesus doesn't judge us. We can continue to do whatever we want. No, no, at this time that he came, he came to die for your sins. He came to, to, to pardon you, to, to, to provide the sacrifice that we needed to die in our place. And he didn't come in judgment. He didn't come to condemn. He came to provide the sacrifice because you needed it. Amen. But then he says, but if I do judge, and I want to tell you there's coming a time when he will judge. There's coming a time when he is going to sit on the throne. The, it's a great white throne of judgment. I mean, it's going to be a serious time. It's going to be a time whenever he says either come in or I don't know you. He will judge. It's just not at this point. Not yet. Because he's given us every opportunity to do what we need to do. To do the work that we need to do to be saved. And if you'll remember, what was the work that we need to do to be saved? Believe. Believe in the one who God sent. Also known as Jesus. That's all you gotta do is invite him in. I'm the one who testifies of myself. My, uh, my other witness is the father who sent me. Now, what, he's, what, what, what Jesus is fighting here, he's fighting a very common battle that keeps happening. The devil, if you'll remember, right after Jesus was baptized, the Holy Spirit came down, and he got up out of the water, and he went straight to the wilderness to fast for 40 days. And while he's in the wilderness, at the, when he's at his weakest point, the enemy comes up, the devil comes up, and says, if you are the Son of God. And what's he doing? He's saying, I want you to prove it. I want you to prove you're who you say you are. I don't believe you're him. Well, what's his plan there? What's his motive? He's trying to put doubt into Jesus' head. Hey, big mistake. It doesn't work that way. You, you're not going to get Jesus to doubt. But this is the same thing that's going on. The Pharisees are like, you're, you're not who you say you are. We don't, but if you've been with us any time the past few weeks, you see where the, the Pharisees have been coming to him and saying, that can't be. We don't know where he's going to come from. And we know where you come from. You come from Galilee. And then a couple verses later, like, but it also says that you're supposed to come from Bethlehem. And you're not from Bethlehem. Oh, they didn't know where he was born. Check the birth certificate, right? They didn't have them, but anyway. So they keep that, they just, they do not want to believe that Jesus is him. And they're trying to put doubt into the people's heads. So they're challenging him in front of the people. Trying to challenge, trying to, to, to put that, plant that seed that God is not your father. You are not the Messiah. You do not belong to God. Same thing the enemy tries to do to us. You do not belong to God. He is not your father. Are you really saved? Now, I'm going to tell you, I want you to, to ask yourself these questions. I want you to examine yourself. I want you to look into the innermost parts of your heart. I want you to struggle with that at times. I want you to, 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 to find proof that you are. Because the same witness that Jesus had is the same witness that you have. What does the Bible say? It tells us. Let me find this one moment. I lost my place. Romans 8.16 The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. The Spirit Himself Amen. is your witness. So whenever you examine your life as you're supposed to do, we can see the, uh, 2 Corinthians 13 and 5. I don't have this one on the computer, but examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. 
do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Then he throws in this little last meddlesome part, unless, of course, you fail the test. So yeah, examine yourself. Check to see if you're on the right side of eternity. Check to see that the Holy Spirit is in you, that that witness is there, because if that witness isn't there, are you? 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Is he there? Can you say that the Spirit is bearing witness, that God has bared witness, that he is, your witness, that he is the other one saying, you belong to him? See, I mess up all the time. I, I, I have sin just as much as all of us have sin. We all have issues with sin. He who says they don't struggle with sin, what does it say? You're a liar. So if we were to raise our hand and say, who struggles with sin? All of us would have to raise our hand. The one who didn't, we could say, lie! But we won't do that because we don't want to have to condemn anybody in here today. So, but we all struggle. And I always find that struggle even in me as the pastor of a church. I, 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 I know I'm saved, but I'm going to tell you that devil keeps coming to me too. Would a righteous man yell like that? Come on. You ever have someone come to you and say, and you call yourself a Christian? Happens all the time, man, all the time. And, I mean, I, I just have to say, you're probably human if that happens to you. So, But we all have struggles. We all have issues. And, and man, somebody's going to see it and somebody's going to question whether you even belong to God. I had a guy tell me the other day, that guy, that guy, he's no Christian. And I know he goes to your church. I said, well, then he fits right in. Because we're all jacked up over there. Can't help it, man. It's just a church full of hypocrites because that's who we are, you know, from the top down, man. We're, we're working on it. But God's, 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 he's doing the work. It just, is he in there doing the work? You know, I, I, I have this, this struggle. Am, am I a, a transformed man who struggles with sin or am I a sinner who temporarily is transformed? See, you can come into the presence of God and you can get to warm fuzzies. You can be like, ooh, the spirit was moving today. Let's go to the bar. We'll get the other spirit going. Oh, uh, this is happening. Uh, uh, this is so exciting. And he, you know, because I want you to, to think about there was this king named Saul who was not a good king. And he liked to go to church, man. He liked it. He would go to what was called the Company of the Prophets, the School of the Prophets. So you can just imagine what that kind of place was like. I mean, they, there was a bunch of people that were, like, prophesying all the time. And they, I mean, they just loved Jesus. They were in their society. They're just doing all this. And Saul would come. And when Saul was with them, there was what's called the Shared Anointing. And the spirit of prophecy would be there. And all the prophets would prophesy. And that, that, that anointing would spill over even into knuckleheads like Saul. And it said Saul, when he was with them, would begin to prophesy. And everybody would be like, what? Is Saul a prophet now? And they were all just really shocked because Saul is jacked up. It doesn't end well for Saul. I mean, I don't put you in heaven, I don't put you in hell, but I got a real strong suspicion about that guy. And yet when he was in a certain place, when he went to church, man, he had the warm fuzzies. He had all that stuff going on. He did. But when he left church, he was still angry. He still wanted to kill people. He's still trying to, to kill David all the time. He, he, he was still going to mediums. Fortune tellers. He was still doing all that stuff, going to witches. And yet this is the guy who just got through prophesying. Am I a sinner who experiences moments of transformation? Or am I transformed 
and sometimes experience sin. Which side of the fence are you on? Are you transformed or just experience the warm fuzzies? Can you see change in your life? It's not always bad to question. It's not always bad to, to examine. But when the devil comes to you, see, here's the thing about it. The devil comes to you and tells you you don't belong to him. I'm going to tell you, the devil is a liar, is he not? And if the devil's coming to trying to convince you that you don't belong to God, then there's probably something there. If the devil's trying to keep you beat down, it's for a reason. Because if you're on his team, he ain't after you. If you belong to him, he ain't after you. So if the devil is coming to you, wouldn't it be even more reason to press into the presence of God? To examine, to make sure, to know. Okay. Verse 19. Then they asked him, Where is your father? Seems just simple enough, isn't it? Because he's been talking to him about my father and me and my father, and he keeps talking about his father. And, and see, but there, there's this little problem that they have is they, you know, he's talking about his dad, and, and they're thinking they're talking about Joseph, maybe, you know, because the, the, they're, they're digging at Jesus. This is a dig at Jesus because he was considered an illegitimate child. Because if you remember, he was born out of wedlock to a little girl named Mary. And I don't think anybody was really buying the story when she said the Holy Spirit just did it. You know, because if somebody came to you today, come on. <laughs> You're pregnant? The Holy Spirit, man, I'm telling you. Because I don't, I man, it happened one time in history, that's all you get, man. Ain't nobody else buying that boat. You know, we just move on. But that, that's a hard pill to swallow. And they're listening to this story and they're like, yeah, right, Mary. I mean, there's even some, some legend that says that her, her father, that, that Jesus' father would have been a Roman soldier who took advantage of Mary. Now, crazy, so there's all kinds of crazy beliefs and ideas out there. Because it just seems like we can't buy into the supernatural. We can't buy into that God is actually powerful enough to do what he says he can do. So they're, they're, they're getting a dig at Jesus. They're going to do it again in verse 41. In verse 41, they're going to say that they're going to do the same thing. We're not illegitimate like you, basically. Because you don't even know who your real dad is. But he knows. That's why they ask him, where is your father? And they're trying to trap him. They're trying to, to, to get him to say something that all the people would be like, oh, Really? So this is Jesus' response. You do not know me or my father. Because that's not what they're doing. We know you. You're that kid from Galilee. You, you, you're kind of a, a, a sassy kid, a smart aleck. You, know, you think you know it all. And, and we know you. He said, no, you don't know me and you don't know my father. And the thing is, you, if you don't know his father, it's because you don't belong to his father. You belong to another father. And we'll get into that later. But if you knew me, you would know my father also. Verse 20. He spoke these words while teaching in the temple courts near the place where the offerings were put. Yet no one seized him because his hour had not yet come. See, they're trying to trap him. They want to stone him. They want to kill him. They, but they can't do it because who's not allowing it? God. This time hadn't come. Verse 21. Once what, more. Jesus said to them, I am going away and you will look for me and you will die in your sin. Where I go, you cannot come. That's pretty hardcore. This made the Jews ask, will he kill himself? Now what? What does that mean? Why, why would you think, well, where I'm going, you can't go. Oh, so what? You're just going to like kill yourself? Does that sound like anything you'd be saying? I, mean, I, don't, I don't even get that. That's just crazy, you know, but... Will he kill himself? Because that's the only place we can't go. That's the only thing I won't do is kill myself, Jesus. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> is that why he says, where I go, you cannot come? Because 
weird anyway. But he continued, you are from below and I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. I told you that you would die in your sins if you do not believe that I am he. You will indeed die in your sins. Verse 25, who are you, they asked. Just what, just what I have been telling you from the beginning, Jesus replied. I have much to say in judgment of you. But he who sent me is trustworthy. And what I have heard from him, I tell the world. He said, I got a lot I could say, but I'm only going to say what God wants me to say. I got a lot I could be telling about you guys right here because I, I, I've read your mail. He said, but I'm only going to say what God wants me to say. Man, if we could get that lesson in our life, huh? She keeps talking. She keeps this up, man. When I get home tonight, it better be different. Or I'm going to speak my mind. If he comes in and all he does is sit in that chair. Mm. When he goes to sleep, I'm going to shave his eyebrows off. They're still there, Don. Still there. Because we're more about what we want. We want to say what we... You know, I got something I got to say. Amen. Or you cannot and be godly. Amen. You cannot and just say what God wants you to say. See, man, I just get... I wish I could do that. But you know, you get in that moment and you're like, you see the crossroad and you know, I should go right, but I'm going to go left. Yeah. And you say the thing that you want to say instead of what God wants you to say. Even Jesus struggled. Even Jesus thought about it. He was tempted in all ways just as us. And he's sitting here looking at these idiot people who are challenging that, he even that he's even the Messiah, that he is who he said he was, and, and they're wanting to kill him. And, and he still, he won't give them a piece of his mind. He's like, I got lots of stuff I want to say about you guys, but I'm only going to say what God wants me to say. So how's God wanting you to handle those situations? Just sidebar, sorry. Okay, <laughs> through meddling. Verse 27, they did not understand that he was telling them about his father. So Jesus said, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, when who has? When you have lifted up the Son of Man. Uh, lifted up is another word for exalted. When you have exalted the Son of Man, now, these people aren't going to exalt the Son of Man. They're not lifting up the Son. This, this isn't a positive thing like, oh, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. You know, that ain't what he's talking about. Because when he said, when, when, when you lift up the Son of Man, when you exalt the Son of Man, the way that's going to happen is, is you're going to put him on a cross. So he's basically telling them, when you have killed me, when you've crucified me, that's he's talking about the crucifixion, then you will know that I am he. You remember that little thing called crucifixion back at Easter time? You know, we celebrate all that stuff. And it, it, there was a point at which everything went dark. And there was a guy, this, this centurion, we're not told much about him. We don't really know who he is. It, it could, could be a centurion that we read about later in the book of Acts. We're not really sure. We don't, we're not given his name. But he's standing there looking at all this stuff that's happening. There's a total eclipse. Everything goes pitch black in the middle of the day. And he makes the statement, surely that was the Son of God. And you know, everybody's standing around going, uh-oh. It like just got dark all of a sudden. Like, maybe that was him. I don't know, maybe there was a guy listening to all this happening. Maybe there was this, this guy named Saul that just happened to be there. Saul of Tarsus, who was working with the, the high priest and who would sometime later start killing Christians. Maybe he was there. Maybe there was all these other leaders that were there. Who Maybe they realized they'd made a mistake. Maybe they realized he 
was the one, even to the point that they had to cover up the resurrection when he came back out. Don't tell anybody what's happened. Don't tell anybody that made that there was angels, that Jesus walked out. Don't tell anybody in that stuff. Let's make up a story that his disciples stole him. Then you will know that I am he and that I do nothing on my own but speak just what the Father has taught me. The one who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do what pleases him. Even as he spoke, many believed in him. So I think there's even something in that last little tagline right there, that last little part of when he's talking. He said, my father's always with me because I'm always doing what pleases him. See, a lot of us, maybe we feel like God has left the building. Like God is not in your picture. God is not around. And, and you, you, you sit here and you wonder, where is he at? Are you doing what pleases him? Are you speaking what he wants you to speak? Are you doing what he wants you to do? Or are you doing your own thing? Because if you're not doing what he wants, think of the children of Israel as they're walking through the wilderness, as they're leaving Egypt, and the fire's in the sky, and some knucklehead goes, hey, what's over that mountain? Well, it's pitch black over there. And you start to walk a little further. And you, 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 you ever realize, I, I, my dad, I used to work with my dad a lot. And, and I was the kid that held the flashlight. And he would be working on something. And he would say, keep the light right here where I'm at. And he'd be working on something. And I'd start daydreaming. <laughs> oh. And he's like, the light. And I'm, oh, yeah. Been in many attics with one light, and then my dad's working on a heater, and I'd be, <laughs> hey, the light, the, the, it's got to be over here where I'm at. I need the light to see. So you start to kind of veer out, and you're looking over here, and the light's over here. You don't realize where the light is. You're, you're just kind of looking over here, and you, you, you can kind of see for a little while. And the longer you go out there, your eyes start to adjust. It gets a little bit darker, and you still the light is getting dimmer, but you're still able to see a little bit. Until suddenly... You don't realize I'm so far away from the light. And I can't even tell where the light's at anymore. Because I've stayed in the darkness so long. And you feel like I'm all alone out here. I, God is not in the picture any longer. I'm a, I've been abandoned to the darkness. But all you've got to do to turn the light back on. Just call out to Him. Start seeking Him again. And you'll start to see the light. The light of life start to shine again. And the thing that you've been running from, the thing that you've been scared of, the thing that you've been facing in your life, when the light begins to shine on it, you realize... It's just a shirt in the closet. It's really nothing to be afraid of. When you come back into the light, and the way you stay in the light, do just what Jesus said. To stay in the light. This is what he said. He has not left me alone. Verse 29. For I always do what pleases him. See, a lot of us in life, man, we want God to be pleased with what we're doing. We, want to, we, we hope that what we've endeavored to, to, to embark on is pleasing to Him. So we'll set out on a journey and we'll think, I hope God's okay with this. And you pray and you're like, God, I hope you're blessing this. I hope this is your idea. I hope this is your will. And it wasn't. And you end up off in left field somewhere, broke down on the side of a road somewhere, because that was never the plan. You tried to make something happen. You tried to, to get rich quick, man. And that was never God's way. So to get back where He wants you, start doing life His way and not your way. 
Start living to please him and not you. Please him. Amen? Amen. See, I don't know where you're at in your life. I don't know what's happening. I don't know the, the, the darkness that you find yourself in, but I know how to get back to the light. Repent. Stop doing the former things. Stop doing the stuff that got you into darkness. Change the way you live. Start pursuing God. Start living life to please Him. And man, that light's going to come back on. It'll change your life. Everything will get better. And the thing you've been so afraid of, you'll realize it cowers to your God. So what is it? What is it that you've got in the middle of that you need to repent of? I hope right now God is speaking something into your life that the Spirit is just speaking something to you, telling you. It's this. We need to change this. We need to stop this. What is God speaking? What is God showing you? It's time to stop going the direction you were going. And start following hard after him. People all the time want to know, how do you get delivered from this thing? How do you get out of this bondage? How do you get away from that thing? Man, you chase him down. Amen. You pursue Jesus and he will change everything. Start living your life for him instead of you. It's just that simple. Can I pray with you today? Let me pray over you. God, we just come to you today. You see our life. You see the situations that we're in. You see the darkness that has shrouded us. And Lord, today we're needing a touch from you. God, we need the light to come back on. We need to cry out to you. Today we repent of that mess that we were in. Today we ask you to come in and set us free. Turn the light back on. Let us know that you're here. Let us know that you are leading. Let us follow after where you go. God, you see the mess that we're in, the darkness that we're in. God, today I pray that you speak into our darkness and declare, let there be light. Deliver us and set us free. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to stand together and we're going to sing one last song together. And if this message has spoke to you in any way, if, it, if you've been in that dark place and, and you want out of that darkness and you want to ask the light of Jesus to come back into your life, He's here to do it. And if you need prayer today for anything, if you, if you need a touch from Jesus, if you need that light to be turned back on, hey, we will pray with you, we will agree with you, we'll cry with you, and we'll see that light come back on in your life. Whatever that struggle is, surrender to His leading. Amen? So while we sing this last song, if you need prayer, you could come and you could find yourself a place to pray, or we will pray with you. But turn the light on. So as we sing, I invite you to come.